We'll continue with the uh, video blog. I said we would continue discussing the divine services. I, I'm reading something I, I had already written some time ago and published. Uh, I think I wrote this um, spiritual and scriptural meaning of the cycle of Orthodox divine services in 1975. So it's been around since 1975. And um, the, incorporated it into scripture and the liturgy, you that stand in the house of the Lord, which I'd written also at the end of the 70s, uh, explaining the divine liturgy in terms of, of the Holy Scripture. This evening we're going to talk about Vespers, which is really the evening watch, which falls, the evening watch itself actually falls between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Vespers is generally celebrated around 7 in most places. Uh, we celebrate it at 5 because of people driving up to two and two and a half hours to come to the monastery for services and then having to drive back late at night. But 7 p.m. is the general time for Vespers and that uh, corresponds to the times of the evening watch. And it was evening and was morning one day. For the Orthodox Church, Vespers is not the end of the day but the beginning of the liturgical day as it was the beginning of the day in, in Byzantium as well. Uh, as the creation of the world, it was evening and it was morning one day. <coughs> Thus Vespers services a daily commemoration of the loving creation of the, the world by the Word Himself, who with that same boundless love would come in the latter times to redeem and save His creation. It is for just this reason that the Vespers service begins with the creation psalm, Psalm 103, which glorifies the wisdom of God in the creation itself. It is said that creation took place in six aeons called days in Scripture. Yet there are eight days of creation. Creation began, as Scripture says, on one day. It doesn't say on day one or on the first day. It says on one day. But the end of the creation cycle is not the sixth day. But Holy Pascha in Scripture, in Scripture we're told that God himself finished his creation on the sixth day. Thus from the sixth day until the coming of Christ was the seventh day. And this is why it says that God rested. It doesn't literally mean that God rested from all his creation, that he took a nap or something like that. But to show this was the seventh day, the, the Sabbath. God rested from creating. So the Sabbath stretches from the end of the creation until Pascha itself. However many centuries, millennia that was. When it says that God rested on the seventh day, this is a prophecy which foretells the repose of Christ in the tomb on the Sabbath, ending the seventh day, bringing to a close the seventh creational day, that is the preparation day. The seventh is the Sabbath, but it's also preparing us. All the prophets spoke during the seventh day of creation, preparing us for the coming of the Messiah that in his resurrection we might see the dawn of the eighth eternal day, which is why Paul says he delineateth, he delineateth yet another day. The eighth day of creation in which we now live is the day of redemption. This is the time of our redemption. The eighth day, the day that leads us into eternity. Now I'm going to uh, step aside from the book for a moment. When we enter into Vespers we realize it's an Old Testament service. Actually, the name of the service is not Vespers. Vespers simply means evening. And in practically every language, it's called just evening. Or the uh, English have a rather charming word for it, evensong, song of the evening. I love that. I wish we could adopt it. But it's the, the uh, service for the lighting of the lamps. In the temple, in Jerusalem, the lamps were lit in the evening, and some of the same psalms that we chant were chanted during the lighting of the lamps. The Vesper service, the service of the lighting of lamps, comes to us directly from the Old Testament, directly from the temple. And the structure of Vespers 
is part of Revelation. You know, the Holy of Holies was the type of paradise. It was there that God said he would fellowship with man face to face. Not that God was contained, circumscribed in the Holy of Holies. But that this was the revelation of that paradise in which, in the beginning, God had fellowship face to face with men. And now, as a type of paradise, where the mercy seat is, not the judgment seat, not the condemnation seat, not the I'll get even with your seat, not the I'll torture my son to death in order to save your seat, the mercy seat. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The mercy seat is there. But the curtain is always closed. This is in the old covenant. The curtain won't be opened now until the crucifixion of Christ, of Great and Holy Friday. When we begin the divine, the, the Vesper service, uh, some traditions will sense the entire church through the open royal gates because the whole, the God's grace was poured out upon the whole of creation. Remember that even in the Old Testament, when incense was burned, the carbon, the charcoal burning, was a type of the pillar of fire that led Israel by night <coughs> out of bondage in Egypt. And that, of course, was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit leading Israel into freedom. The cloud of smoke appeared in the daytime. So the incense burning, sending up the cloud of smoke, is a type of the pillar of smoke that led them during the day. Also, manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So every time incense is used in the church, there's some reason for manifesting the Holy Spirit in connection with that. The priest will come out of the, or the deacon, out of the holy place, usually through the side door, not through the royal gates, but generally through the side door, since the entire church, and then go back into the Holy of Holies, the altar. As if the Holy Spirit is calling us also to enter in to the presence of God, to fellowship with God face to face, to hope to enter into the heavenly kingdom through the grace, leadership, and teaching by the Holy Spirit. Then the doors and the curtain will be closed. Sometimes, in some traditions, the doors and curtain are closed. In the, pre the beginning of the service, the priest comes out and stands always bareheaded in front of the closed royal gates with the curtain drawn and reads the prayers of the lighting of the lamps whilst the creation song is continued will always be sung while the sensing of the church is taking place at the beginning of Vespers or if that's in a tradition where that isn't done the creation song is chanted while the priest stands in front of the closed royal gates reading the prayer for the lighting of the lamps I know that some people, especially some of the converts, thought they would improve on the divine services by having the priest read the um, prayers for the lighting of the lamps inside uh, following the litanies, but they've destroyed the entire meaning of Vespers that way. And that's one of the terrible things that happens when people want to improve on the wisdom of the Holy Church. Uh, the priest is a type of all mankind standing outside the closed royal gates. Because mankind has closed the gates of paradise against himself. It isn't that God threw man out of paradise as punishment. And the Holy Fathers clearly tell us that death is not a punishment from God for man's sin. Death is absolutely not a punishment from God for man's sin. Death is a result of man separating himself from the only source of life. Man was always mortal, man was created mortal. Man does not have an immortal soul. Only God can be immortal. If man's soul was immortal, then man would be a God and not a human, not something created. The Holy Church tells us that man was not immortal. His soul was not immortal. 
It was intended that by divine grace he could share in God's immortality. That's called theosis, when we uh, spiritually begin to participate in the immortality of God and the grace profoundly in the energies of God and in, in immortality. So mortality was always there, man was always mortal, but he would live through his union with God. But he separated himself from God. Then death entered in for mankind. Death, of course, existed for other things, but mankind is unique, a unique creation in, in the image and likeness of God. Well, when man left paradise, uh, departed from his presence and direct union with God, where he could fellowship face to face with God. The doors of paradise were closed and the angels, it says, stood against anyone re-entering. Of course, paradise is noetic. It's wherever the presence and the light of the glory of God shine is paradise. So mankind has closed the gates of paradise against himself. So the priest, as a type of all mankind, standing in lamentation outside the closed gates of paradise, with the nostalgia for paradise, as uh, uh, St. Alexander Kalomeros called it, desiring to re-enter into paradise, longing for paradise, hungering for paradise. Something deep inside of man calls him toward the return to paradise. The creation psalm is finished. The priest generally goes back into the altar. If there's a deacon, of course, it's a little different. Then the liturgies are served. The Lord I cried unto thee is chanted. Then, coming out from the side deacon's door, the north door, the entire church is sensed again by the deacon or the priest. Again, the outpouring of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I cried unto thee, hear me, hearken unto me, pay attention to me, listen to my prayer. Lord, I cried unto you, hear me. Let my prayer rise as incense before you, and the lifting up my hand, of my hands be an evening sacrifice. O oh Lord, hear me and save me and bring me back into paradise once more. Drive away the darkness. Pour forth the grace of your Holy Spirit upon all of us. That we might see the way back into paradise. So the entire church has sensed again this revelation of the Holy Spirit filling all things. And toward the end, the royal gates, the curtain and royal gates are open again. Sometimes the curtain is not closed, but anyway. The royal gates are open. Again, we see into paradise. Then we have the entrance with the censer. And at the end of it, the priest says, Wisdom, pay attention. Wisdom, stand aright, pay attention. Listen. You've asked God to listen to you, now listen to him. Pay attention. And we sing the joyous light. There's a joyous light just about sunset. It used to be kind of time so that the sun would be setting. Because now that we have come to the setting of the sun, we praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the priest enters back into the altar. Then we sing the evening procumenon. The royal gates are closed after, again. Because we've seen a vision of paradise. We've seen a revelation of the paradise which is to come. The royal gates are closed. And the rest of the vespers takes place with the royal gates closed. And we sing the apostica which teaches us about our salvation. The little verses in the Lord of Christ and the apostica are there to teach us something. Finally, in the end, we receive the blessing from the priest. And what we've done now is to revisit the Old Testament. You'll notice that in Vespers, particularly on the eaves of feast days, we read from the Old Testament 
We do not read from the New Testament in Vespers. It is never done. We read from the Old Testament. Now on the eves of feast days, this is very important, because the passages from the Old Testament that we read are prophecies about the very feast day that we're going to celebrate, that event in the life of Christ that we are going to celebrate the next morning in the Matins and the Divine Liturgy. We read from the Old Testament. The veil is still drawn. The, cur the, the, the doors are still closed. And then we depart. If there's a vigil, some churches will serve a vigil on the eve of feast days, serve matins immediately afterward. Uh, other time, matins in the morning, but we'll discuss matins in a few minutes. Just wanted to remind people again of what the meaning of Vespers is and what it is that it teaches us. What is proclaimed to us in Vespers. The whole history, the creation, the fall of mankind, the divine grace pouring out on all the world at the creation itself, then the doors are closed. And well, since again, when we're crying out unto the Lord, when we're calling upon the Lord to hear us, hear us, O Lord, and forgive us, lead us back into paradise. So we see, again, the type of the pillar and the column of smoke, which led Israel out of bondage, the grace of the Holy Spirit to lead us out of bondage, to lead us back into paradise, to bring us back into communion with God, and to make our hearts paradise also. So the entrance, then we finish the service and we can enter into Matins if it's a vigil. And um, I want to go ahead with Matins then this, this time. Uh, we have two other services between us and Matins normally. And these are not done in parishes because it's really not possible to do it done generally in monasteries. The first one is Compline, which is the night watch, and actually it begins it's between 10 and 12, 10, 9 and 12, sorry, uh, 9 and 12, I have a misprint on my book, and it will be served after the evening meal. And that's why it's called Apodignis in Greek, and uh, after supper, after the evening meal. And uh, Compline in English, Poviceria in Slavonic, Poviceria Vecere, after the evening meal. So Compline. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be at peace. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. You have put joy in my heart. I will lie down in peace and sleep. For you, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. It's from the fourth psalm. The Compline service, together with the prayer before going to bed, is read after supper. In Slavonic, it's called Poviceria, literally after supper. In it, we recall that sleep is an image of death. Compline has three parts. In the first, we thank God for his help during the day. We lament our sinful faults. We ask God's help to face our inevitable repose from this life in peace and repentance. Secondly, we pray for help to pass through the sleep of this present light, free of sin and passions. Finally, we pray for our neighbors and for those who are in authority in the church, those who are traveling, those who are in prisons, or grievous circumstances of all Orthodox Christians everywhere. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, but rather let all bitterness, wrath and danger and anger be put away from you. In the monastery is the last service of the day, at the end of it, we ask forgiveness of one another. Here in the monastery we do that vespers uh, to ask forgiveness because that's the time when some of the laity will be here and they can participate also in the forgiveness service. It's especially nice when families are here, and each member of the family will ask everyone in the church, including the other members of their own family, for forgiveness. And we encourage people to do that at home. 
in the evening, go and stand in front of your icon corner. Uh, yes, all the Orthodox Christians, I'm sure you have an icon corner in the main room of your house, in the living room somewhere, and that you go and stand there often and at least make the sign of the cross and pray. So, if the family can gather there in the evening before bedtime, say some prayers, even if it's only the Lord's Prayer, and ask each other for forgiveness. In the monastery, Compline is a time of forgiveness and seeking forgiveness. During the service, we diligently search our hearts to discern what sins we have committed against one another during the previous day, to ferret out malice, grudges, wrath, self-righteousness, anger, condemnation, judgment that we've passed, these things that may be lurking within us, waiting for Satan to take occasion of them to injure our souls. Oh, how often we cooperate with Satan in his efforts to injure us and injure our souls and injure our brothers and sisters. We become Satan sometimes because Satan is the one who tempts and judges. Having thus weighed our own souls, we are able with sincerity of heart to ask one another's forgiveness at the end of the service and to give our forgiveness to each other. To the best of our ability, we strive to extend this repentance and forgiveness to those not present. Since sleep is an image of death, we do not wish to fall asleep burdened with passions of wrath and malice or anger, just as we do not wish to die with such sins still intact and alive upon our souls. Thus, confidence should be for all believers a time of repentance of sins against neighbors, a time to seek forgiveness and reconciliation, not only with God, but with our brothers and sisters, with our neighbors. Compline, which is often followed immediately by the reading of the prayers before going to bed, is a reminder of our own mortality and calls us to our senses, teaching us to repent and correct our lives so that we may face death and the judgment and peaceful hope. This is clearly seen in the prayer before sleep, which is read in the bedtime prayers at the end of Compline. O oh, man befriending Lord, is this bed to me my coffin, or will you enlighten my soul with another day? Here the coffin lies before me, and death confronts me. And finally, just as we lie down to sleep, into thy hands, O Lord Jesus Christ my God, I commit my soul and body. Bless me, save me, and grant me everlasting life. This is a reality which faces all mankind, the end of our lives on earth. It's coming to all of us. The foolish attempt to hide from it and neglect to call it to mind to prepare for it. In so doing, they place their hope mainly in this life and material things. The wise person calls it to mind and prepares for it in love and faith, full of hope in the mercy of God who receives our repentance and the love of our Savior Jesus Christ who has conquered death for those who follow him in faith. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him there is plenteous redemption, we read in the 129th Psalm. The midnight hour, never be done at home, I should think, nocturnes, it's called sometimes, from 12 midnight to 3 a.m. is the hour of the watch. Not that the service lasts that long, thank heavens, but uh, it's um, the midnight watch, and we keep these watches of the day. Behold, the bridegroom cometh in the middle of the night, and blessed is the servant whom he shall find watching, but unworthy is he whom he shall find heedless. This is from the Troparion in Tone 8 for the bridegroom service. The services of the midnight hour come to us directly from the holy apostles, who carefully and fearfully remembered how they slept in the garden and could not watch and pray with our Savior for even one hour. Brothers and sisters, doesn't it describe us so often? What, could you not tarry and pray with me even for an hour? Could you not be watchful and pray? Could you not accompany me? Could you not stay near to me even for one hour, our Savior asks us? So the Compline, the midnight hour, really takes us into the Garden of Gethsemane, together with the Apostles. Christ is praying taking upon himself the burdens of all mankind, pouring out sweat of blood because 
of the grief and sorrow he has over the condition of humanity. And this is the cup that he asks to have relieved from him, removed from him, the grief and sorrow over the condition of mankind. Not the cup of being crucified, he's accepted that freely. And the Holy Fathers tell us that he had no fear of death, but that wasn't the cup that he was praying to have removed from him in Gethsemane. We know what it was, the great outpouring of the co-suffering love of God, which is the motive for our salvation. Or the Metropolitan Anthony Kropovitsky, uh, whom we call St. Anthony of Kiev, would say, co-suffering love is the moral idea in the dogma of redemption. Hearkening to the Savior's warnings, they passed his injunction on to all. Be ready, for the Son of Man will come in an hour which you do not expect. Watch, therefore, for you do not know either the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man will come. Watch, therefore, and pray constantly or consistently that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. For behold, I shall come as a thief in the night, and blessed is he who shall be found watching and keeping his garments upon himself, ready, always ready. This is from Matthew, Luke, and the book of Revelations all combined. The midnight hour, therefore, is a constant anticipation of the second coming of our Savior Jesus Christ and the judgment which, according to the gospel, will take place suddenly in the night when the careless and the unfaithful least expect it. And I must say, brothers and sisters, that it is with a great deal of sorrow that I see that so many people have adopted this novelty doctrine called the rapture, which after all began only in 1840, a new doctrine. Because these people and those who think, I have a hundred percent guarantee that I will enter into the heavenly kingdom. No, you don't. You have no such guarantee. Our Lord Jesus Christ told you to watch and pray. If you have all of this arrogant self-assurance, you're not going to watch and pray at all. You're going to be asleep when the Savior comes. Besides, if you have that attitude, you can do any kind of wicked deed, thinking it won't make any difference because your salvation is assured. There will be no rapture before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be many martyrs. Many people will suffer martyrdom to testify to the gospel and to our Lord Jesus Christ, just as they were in the first three centuries, and as there was under the communists at other times, under the Turks and at other times. There is no rapture. Never let any Orthodox Christian disobey or disregard the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and not keep watch diligently. This service calls us to an awareness of the preparation for the inescapable event that we may not be given over to death and shut out of the kingdom. But meditating on the awesome day, watch, keep your vigil lamp lighted and filled with oil. It's the prayer of Compline, the prayer of the midnight hour, or nocturne, brother. I remember Vladika Anthony Kropovitsky preaching, well, I don't remember personally, I wasn't quite there, he died five years before I was born. Not in Texas, by the way. I was born elsewhere. But a lot of Russians were all packed and ready to go back to Russia. But they were thinking mostly about vengeance, getting revenge on the socialists first to cause the revolution, and then the communists who caused the civil war, took over after the civil war. The communists didn't start the revolution. It was started by the socialists. It was Kerensky's revolution, not, uh, not Lenin's. He won the Civil War and threw Kerensky out. Kerensky was an atheist, a socialist, and the destroyer of Imperial Russia, later taught at St. Vladimir's, uh, St. Vladimir, at uh, Saint Serge Academy in Paris. That showed you the quality of Saint Serge and its theology. Uh, but he, he was responded to these Russians who were so anxious to get vengeance and overthrow the communist and restore Imperial Russia, 
a metropolitan entity was a patriot. He was loyal to the Tsar, the imperial government, and to Russia. But in one of his sermons, he said, uh, You all dream of returning to a homeland which has been taken from us. And you dream of the restoration of a smiting Tsar who will punish the enemies. But none of you want to think about that homeland to which you must return and from which there is no escape. There may never be, he said, another imperial Russia. Russia may never be free again. But you must all go to that homeland which none of you desire, but which none of you can escape. You must all return one day to the earth from which you were created. It's better, my brethren, to prepare yourself to return to that homeland in the hope of the heavenly kingdom than to think about returning to your earthly homeland to get vengeance. Those are the words of St. Anthony Kropovitsky, Metropolitan of Kiev. Some people were infuriated by them, by the way. We're not going to go on to the Don Watch or Matins this evening because it's a little long, perhaps waxing a little long. But this booklet, The Spiritual and Scriptural Meaning of the Cycle of Orthodox Christian Divine Services, send me an email or send a mailing address from the comment section of YouTube and I'll send anybody a free copy, 10 free copies, 50 free copies, however many you might want. But I think it's worth studying to know and to understand the cycle of divine services and we'll progress through the liturgy as well and I think knowing the meaning of these services is immensely important and very helpful in our spiritual lives and I think you'll all get much more out of the divine services by studying it a little. Completely free of charge, just send us an email to synaxis at orthodoxcanada.org and say I would like the free book on the Divine Services, the booklet. A little later we'll give away the copies of the book on the liturgy when we get to that part. But thank you all for joining us and I thank you all for your prayers. Many of you know have been very severely ill and uh, although I have these good moments such as this evening, um, mostly because I'm not doing any chemo or radiation right now. But uh, still, um, also looking down into the earth from which I was created, expecting to be there again in the rather near future. But I want to ask you all for your prayers. Thank you all for your prayers. And remember the great greeting of this time of year. Christ is risen. God bless you all.